In an era of downloadable content and patch culture, the majority of competitive games and esports in the mainstream today nowadays find themselves with the phenomenon that most other prevalent forms of competition don't seem to deal with as frequently. Balance adjustments. Now, very occasionally in professional sports or games like poker and chess, we see some minor rule changes or adjustments, but nothing to the level that we see in esports and competitive games. Games like Valorant and League of Legends get meta-evolving roster additions multiple times a year, in addition to routine patch updates that adjust game balance as often as twice a month. Unlike its contemporaries in esports, however, and competitive games, competitive Pokemon has a year-long circuit where the game out of the box is basically the same game we use at the World Championships. In 2015 and 2016, a lot of the dominant strategies used to win the first events of the season ended up placing very, very well at the World Championships many, many months later. Notoriously high usage Pokemon like Kangaskhan and Talonflame, while in their primes, had a chokehold on the meta until they were toned down in Generation 7. The thing is, in competitive Pokemon VGC, the only real balance changes happens between games, and that doesn't always line up with the formats that we get. At the end of 2019, Sword and Shield finally managed to break this cycle, but at a cost. The introduction of the Crown Tundra and Isle of Armor DLCs gave VGC competitors a fresh new set of toys to play with, but it also gave us a look at what game-breaking Pokemon DLC could look like. Regieleki, Urshifu, Kyalorex, if you played Sword and Shield VGC at all in the last few years, you'll know how dominant these Pokemon have been. Many of us look forward to the day where we wouldn't have to face these threats anymore. As I said previously, Pokemon's biggest balance changes happen between games, and even more so between generations. So Generation 9 and Scarlet and Violet on the horizon, I decided to put together a deep dive into how these changes have shaped the last decade of competitive Pokemon VGC, for better or for worse. Now, I want to start in regards to nerfs. And more specifically, I want to talk about nerfs to status moves. One of the first major balance adjustments that we saw in competitive VGC came as a result of overrepresentation of a few Pokemon movesets in the 2013 format, which is my all-time favorite competitive VGC format. Thunders and Amoongus in particular illustrated just how disruptive status conditions could be. And when X and Y came out the following year, one of the best nerfs we got were to status inflicting moves. Electric types can no longer be paralyzed, and grass types can no longer be put to sleep by powder moves like Spore or sleep powder. Taking it one step further, Safety Goggles was a brand new item that was introduced, and it granted its holder immunity to powder moves. In the following generations, we also saw other nerfs to status conditions. For example, the accuracy of Swagger was reduced, and the chance of a Pokemon to hit themselves in confusion was also reduced. Burn damage was chipped from an eighth of its Pokemon health to a sixteenth, and Paralysis was also changed to only cut speed in half rather than one-fourth. In addition, the main move that generally inflicts paralysis in Thunder Wave had its accuracy reduced as well. A lot of these changes I think would have been very relevant for a certain semi-final set at the World Championships many, many years ago. And yes, it is, as Cresselia and Rotom are both unable to move. And you can see the look on Aaron's face right there. Not great. The second category of nerfs I want to talk about are to abilities. Now, after Generation 5, there seemed to be a major theme of giving Pokemon exclusively strong abilities, like Kangaskhan's Parental Bond. This design philosophy has persisted into later games and generally seems like a good direction to go, but sometimes it makes it harder to identify the overall strength of just the ability rather than a Pokemon's kit as a whole. That being said, thankfully, we have now seen, you know, multiple nerfs to abilities that were super centralizing. For example, Kangaskhan dominated three full formats of VGC before it finally got nerfed, and Parental's Bond's 1.5 bonus turned down to 1.25 was just enough to stabilize it when it returned back in 2018. Mega Salamence and Gardevoir both were very strong, especially in the 2015 format, and they had their abilities reduced from a 30% bonus to a 20% bonus. Poor Sylveon unfortunately caught a stray in the process. Terrain boosts were also similarly nerfed, going from 50% to 30% in terms of a damage increase in what seemed like a change specifically to reduce the presence of Pokemon like Tapu Koko and Tapu Lele. Prankster also got a slight nerf as it was now unable to affect dark types, and lastly there were a couple of changes that also seemed to maybe be geared a little bit more towards singles. One thing to talk about are weather activating abilities. They no longer are permanent, and while this would count as a nerf, it felt like a more necessary change to prevent the overabundance of the new Pokemon gaining access to abilities like Torkoal and Pelipper. We also saw some HP specific design changes that made huge impacts to these abilities exclusive users. For example, Mimikyu had its ability disguise changed so that it would have to eat up an eighth of its health when hit 
hit by any damaging move, even if the move wouldn't do that much damage. This was intriguing because it essentially took into account the most common item that Mimikyu would use when changing it, which was Focus Sash. Focus Sash plus Mimikyu was just a crazy combination because with it, it would be really, really hard to essentially deny a Trick Room. Talonflame Scale Wings also came into this condition where it needed to be at full health to activate, and Talonflame was one of the most dominant Pokemon in the VGC 2014 format. But, of course, it also uh, was a big boon to the Pokemon in singles where entry hazards are common and in doubles where fake out cycling is a staple of the meta. Overall, I actually think the majority of these ability nerfs were smart and led to healthier metagames for these Pokemon going forward. The third category of nerfs I want to talk about are to damage output. One huge change that happened from generation 5 to 6 was the reduction of a damage output of dozens of moves. Offensive Pokemon seemed to be too overwhelming in black and white, so a huge hit list of the hardest hitting low drop bad moves had their damage reduced by about 5 to 10 base power. The list of everything hit is here. What's interesting about this change specifically is that the major threats were special attacking moves with high distribution. Ice Beam, Flamethrower, and Thunderbolt all being in that category. Draco Meteor and Hydro Pump have lower distribution, but still seem to have too much power for a stable metagame. That being said, moves like Close Combat and Hyper Beam weren't touched. I think my theory is that if the drawback is deemed costly enough, the damage output is justified. Focus Blast and Zap Cannon didn't change, but Magma Storm did at a cool 75% accuracy. Blizzard, Thunder, and Hurricane also lost some base power as well. But all of those can have 100% accuracy in their respective weather conditions. So in line with that, 70% accuracy, reducing two stat categories, and sacrificing a turn are the threshold for what classifies as costly enough. We'll be sure to keep an eye on that if it changes into Gen 9. Some extras as well were Explosion, which received a nerf to its initial defense having mechanic, and Aura Sphere, which went from 90 base power to 80 base power. The Explosion nerf was actually a really big deal in competitive VGC. Explosion was used very widely in Generation 4, which was when VGC was first introduced, and you would see strategies like Metagross, for example, using Explosion. That took a huge hit, and it went from a move that we saw very frequently to to a move that became a lot more obsolete. The fourth category of nerfs I want to talk about are move changes. Sticking to the theme of adjusting moves, there have been some noticeable changes to moves that are overrepresented in VGC. 2013, once again, did a lot of damage, and Generation 6 was a turning point. Follow Me and Rage Powder dropped into a lower priority bracket, from plus 3 to plus 2, essentially buffing Fake Out and fast extreme speed in the process but toning down the power of the level of redirection as a whole. I'd say that this change worked out well because the majority of these Follow Me users weren't super fast. Substitute also got a unique change to better match the move's design. Sound moves now bypass Substitute. This change gave Snarl and Hyper voice users a slight buff, and we actually saw this at the finals of the 2018 World Championships. One major nerf to a single move on only one Pokemon that could learn it was Dark Void. Well, technically two, because of course Darkrai learns it, but you know, Smeargle was the only one that would be able to use it in VGC. If you played VGC 2016 at all, you'll know that Smeargle was one of the most oppressive Pokemon. Combination of Dark Void and Moody was just unbelievable. The move's accuracy was dropped to 50%, and Smeargle could no longer learn it metaphorically sending Smeargle to a pretty dark place. One minor change was to the move Destiny Bond as well, which now has a chance to fail like Protect. Seemed kind of like a weird change to make at first glance, but I'd say it worked out well. This changed the flow of how the Destiny or the strategy of Destiny Bond and Trick Room meshed together. It also prevented Destiny Bond spam on Pokemon trying to induce scenarios where they could just get a guaranteed free switch. Lastly, one of the major, major changes that affected VGC was the changes to Protect, Detect, Spiky Shield, and King Shield. All of them had their successive use chances changed from a half to a third, which is a very healthy change to the notorious, hey, if I get a double protect strategy, I win. VG's players love to bank on this all too much, especially on the last turn of Trick Room. The last category of nerfs I want to talk about are just ones that don't fit any of the categories that we have already talked about up until this point. They all basically acted as miscellaneous balance changes that were a different approach from the norms that I listed previously. The first of such was the nerf to critical hits. Up until Generation 6, critical hits basically did double the amount of damage, which drastically swings turns and truthfully, because there is no boosting item that does double damage, made unpredictable crits really game-changing. In Generation 6, the damage of critical hits was changed to only 1.5 times, making them a lot more manageable as EV spreads usually factored in stuff like Helping Hand or Choice Item boosts, which essentially a crit would do. Additionally, the frequency of critical hits changed from 116 to 124. It doesn't really seem to have influenced how often they happen to me, but it does seem like a smart change. Another very simple but effective change to VGC came in the form of move distribution. From Gen 7 to Gen 8, a plethora of Pokemon lost access to moves like Toxic and Tailwind. Part of this decision may have been influenced by 
stall tactics and singles, but Tailwind not being on Pokemon like Zapdos and Togekiss made for way less total speed control options overall, and shaped the VGC metagame quite a bit. It's not a surprise that we saw Whimsicott dominate so much throughout Sword and Shield as one of the prominent Tailwind users. Similarly, the complete removal of some moves made entire strategies more viable. Guy Drop was a decently consistent way to stop Trick Room from going up in 2017, and a bunch of Pokemon learned this move. It may be because the move was often found to actually have bugs, but taking it out of the game did end up making Trick Room a bit more viable in early VGC 2020. Hidden Power was removed entirely, and that meant that Pokemon like Hurtana and now Ego didn't need to take anxiety medication before participating in the best of one international challenges online. Return and Frustration also got the boot from the game entirely. I'd like to think this was a result of trainers in general being bad at managing their Pokemon's friendship levels, but it was likely a necessary change to make room for other normal type moves to be used since nothing really beat the consistent damage of Return and Frustration at their max level. Just ask Mega Kangaskhan. We've talked a lot about nerfs up until this point, so now it's time to move on onto buffs. Now, once again, we're gonna split it into different categories, and the first category I want to talk about is abilities. When considering the buffs that Pokemon have received over time, there truthfully haven't been too many buffs to existing Pokemon by conventional means. The way in which the buffs have actually been approached feels more additive. They'll create new Pokemon abilities or moves to do something that otherwise would be missing. Card games like Pokemon TCG and Hearthstone actually often function similarly. One of the premier ways this happens is through new abilities. In some cases, they'll add extra properties to some existing abilities, and in very niche cases, the distribution of abilities increases. But primarily, the changes will come in a completely new ability. Some of the major inclusions over the years really do stand out as balance adjusting, though. The first one I really want to talk about here is Terrain. Now, the Terrain Surges offered a very strong passive resistance to sleep with Electric Terrain and all status afflictions through Misty Terrain. You could counter them as well because the other terrains provide a different boost and could be applied to the field to reset vulnerabilities to statuses. We saw Tapu Koko usage rise rapidly in 2017, and to counter this, there was the famous core of Tapu Lele with Torkoal and Lilligan to manage terrains while also firing off sleep powders with Lilligan. Priority moves also got some counterplay. The aforementioned Psychic Surge set Psychic Terrain, which prevented moves like Fake Out from activating, and even prevented Gale Wing's Talonflame from any flying moves at full health. Abilities like Queenly Majesty and Dazzling also acted similarly, without the caveat of having to set up an entire terrain, meaning that even Pokemon flying in the air on your side were guaranteed the immune Unity to priority moves. Intimidate, Snarl, and Icy Wind would be considered no drawback if not for the existence of Pokemon with Defiant, Competitive, and to an extent, Contrary. These abilities all act as Intimidate, hate, and added a level of counterplay to stat reduction in general that hadn't been seen in the game before. Corviknight in particular was an interesting example that got access to mirror armor, which reflected stat drops back at the user. Going further with design philosophy, Inner Focus, Scrappy, and Oblivious were granted immunity to Intimidate as well. This change alone made the legendary dogs from Generation 2 way more viable, and gave Mamoswine a much needed buff that it totally deserved as it got power crept in later generations. Friend Guard acted as a buff to basically one Pokemon, Clefairy, but it was such a powerful ability that it warranted the use of the little guy and many teams focus on setup strategies. Some honorable mentions to abilities that specifically fell targeted to enable new meta strats are Stalwart, which was used on Duraludon and ignores redirection. Unseen Fist is another one, of course on Urshifu, which I don't know what they were thinking of when they came up with this. It creates a uniquely heinous workaround to a Protect Heavy format in VGC. And Beast Boost, which is basically just Moxie boosted to the next level. Enabling a purely ramp style of gameplay when used on offensive Pokemon like Ultra Beasts, such as Feromosa, Kartana, and Naoigo, it would allow it to snowball very, very quickly. Of this bunch, I think Unseen Fist and Beast Boost maybe gave their users a little too much juice, but I really loved Stalwart out of this group, because it was a fantastic idea for a board state bypassing ability that, that I'd love to see more of. The last major game-changing ability we've seen implemented recently is Neutralizing Gas. This eliminates the activation of any ability, including ones that hinder their users, such as Regigigas and Slacking. Because of this ability's existence, Weezing and Regigigas became a staple combination that actually even made it all the way to the finals of the Players' Cup 2, a major online VGC tournament. Weezing has never really been the most viable Pokemon in VGC, so giving it a really strong ability was a great way to introduce new strategies, where the only drawback was the Weezing taking up a slot on your team and maybe denying you some of the abilities you do want to use. The next category of buffs I want to talk about are two items. Similar to abilities, new items get added as well. Many items seem to target the more overtuned elements of competitive matches, and very often, item additions will provide new strategies to make gameplay more interesting as well. But before that, I want to address a specific buff that was given to Pinchberries that had a massive impact on the 2017 metagame. If you didn't already know, Pinchberries are five unique berries that activate when a Pokemon's held drops below a third, with the condition that it can cause confusion. If the nature of a Pokemon doesn't benefit a particularly stacked category, it will just give it 50% health back. 
with no confusion. In 2017, this buff was absolutely massive and led to many teams running up to three or even four of these berries on their Pokemon. Snorlax and Muck in particular also got to abuse this ability even more because of their ability Gluttony, which allows a berry holder to activate the Pinch Berry at only half of its health rather than a third, effectively giving you a super powered Citrus Berry. Game Freak realized just how crazy this was and nerfed them down to a third bonus health in the following generation, to the point where you would still see them being used but not nearly as frequent as back in 2017. As we stated earlier, some items also added entirely new strategies to the game. Weakness policy is one of the biggest ones to talk about and probably one of the most relevant ones for any of you that have played VGC in the last few years. It doubles the offensive stats of a Pokemon hit by a super effective move, and activating this with your own partner using moves like Bulldoze or Shadow Sneak gave Dragapult, Rhyperior, and Metagross an exclusively useful seat in the metagame in early Sword and Shield. This item was made even more prominent through Dynamax, of course, and even before Dynamax, we saw a fair share of its use on on tanky Pokemon such as Aegislash and Tyranitar. Of course, with Weakness Policy, it also really enabled some strategies such as Colossal with Steam Engine, and we actually even ended up seeing Charizard with Weakness Policy towards the end of the format at the 2022 World Championships. Power Up also made for two-turn charging moves to skip their initial charge turn, making Xerneas with Geomancy, and now you go with Meteor Beam especially threatening. Eject Button was a fun addition, granting Pokemon that didn't have access to pivoting moves an option to switch out when hit immediately with the damaging move. This was a key feature for the Hitmon Top on Wolf Clicks 2016 World Championship winning team, and also has been a major item, especially for Perish Trap based strategies. Rocky Helmet and Red Card also get honorary mentions here because, while not as frequent, they also acted as unique checks to discourage offensive threats from attacking into their holder. Some may conclude that these items were actually even specifically designed to counter Kangaskhan and Xerneas, as those were the Pokemon most impacted by these effects. And Rocky Helmet Ferrothorn, in particular, for example, would be used so that Kangaskhan would just take a ton of its health if you were to switch in Ferrothorn. The last of the additive design choices in this section are moves. Many moves in this game are incredible and offer their own unique flair. But as mentioned previously, the exclusivity of these moves can be a hindrance. For example, Oblivion Wing is an amazing move limited to Evil Tall, and some moves like Burning Jealousy and Speed Swap have better distribution, but only a few good use cases in VGC. That being said, there have been some moves that get wider distribution that change or even operate as corrections to what would be a wild meta. The first one to talk about here for VGC is Parting Shot. Parting Shot was initially introduced as an exclusive to Pokemon X and Y. This move is incredible. It reduces the attack and special attack of the target and switches the user out. Goro, even with this amazing move, just saw no usage, sadly, or very little usage. But the move later found itself on Alolan Persian, and of course, Incineroar later on, both of which saw usage, and both of which would carry Parting Shot on almost every move set they ran. I personally think that Incineroar did not need to get Parting Shot, it was also plenty fine beforehand, but, you know, it was a staple technique for combating some of the most overpowered Pokemon, especially in the looming 2022 format, where it was very, very needed. Grassy Glide is the 70 base power move that gains a plus one priority when used in grassy terrain. Now, the primary user of this is Rillaboom, who sets their own terrain to abuse this, but many other Pokemon get access to this move, such as Serena being one of the next best users. Aurora Veil was a move that, while offered to every hail setter, ended up only really being used in the VGC metagame on Alola Ninetales, and very occasionally, maybe something like Vanellux, but it was really just Ninetales. It essentially acted as Reflect and Light Screen bundled into one move, with the condition that he'll be active in order for the move to succeed. It was a great way to bring Hail into a meta, even when Abomasnow was no longer a consistent option. Abomasnow was very, very good way back in the day, but really just fell off afterwards. And of course, Gigantamax Lapras and Sword and Shield also allowed you to set up Aurora Veil, which I think was uniquely cool for Lapras. Talking about Ice types, furthering on the buffs on Ice types, Freeze Dry was a neat little move that both buffed Ice types that got access to it and offered counterplay to those pesky water types that would normally mitigate the weakness of their secondary typings like Groudon and Ludicolo. I'd love to see more takes on moves like this, like a fire type extinguishing move that is super effective against fire, or something of the sort. Eerie Impulse was a move that was added in generation 6, but the move's distribution was increased later on. This move reduces the special attack of its target by 2, essentially acting like a special version of charm. Giving the move to Pokemon like Porygon 2, Rotom, and Thunderous increased its usage by a ton, and we saw it a lot especially in Sword and Shield. Increased Increasing the distribution to strong support Pokemon was a smart way to limit the damage output of the most vicious special attackers all across the metagame. Body Press was a move that was such a strong addition it created a new win condition in VGC. Pokemon like Ferrothorn, Slowbro, and even Registeel now had a goal that could strive for a late game win condition. Alternatively, it gave Pokemon that were routinely subjected to Intimidate Cycling a consistent damage option even without setup like Stack Attack and Bronze on. Some other honorary mentions in this category include Expanding Force, Rising Voltage, and Poltergeist. Each of these moves brought something different to the table, and all of them 
them ended up doing their part in shaping their respective metagames throughout the years. The overall design philosophy of each option was precise and adhered to its initial intended effect. Scarlet and Violet is for sure going to bring up a bunch of these new moves into the mix, and I'm excited to see how it'll shake things up. The next thing I want to talk about here is diving into typing adjustments. Now, dating all the way back to Generation 2, and back then VGC didn't even exist, additional typing choices seem to be the nuclear failsafe option that gets resorted to when the game really gets unbalanced. Psychic types and to an extent ghost types were clearly a step above the rest of the type chart in Gen 1, so adding in a type that resists both steel and is immune to psychic types, dark, was the measure that we saw taken. In Gen 6, the fairy type was introduced to end the reign of dragon types that we saw throughout all of Generation 5 by becoming a complete immunity and super effective check, but it also served to manage the strength of dark and fighting type Pokemon as well, which were quite powerful as we saw through Pokemon like Conkeldur, Terrakion, Tyranitar, Hydreigon, and more in VGC formats previously. Typing adjustments haven't been limited to just adding new types to the new Pokemon though. Dark typing gained an immunity to Prankster, and ghost types gained the ability to ignore trapping abilities like Shadow Tag. When Generation 6 added the fairy typing, it even gave it to some existing Pokemon like Togekiss and Azumarill, both which reaped the benefits immediately. Along with this, the steel typing that initially boasted 10 resistances and 1 immunity to poison would have 12 defensive matchups with the addition of fairy. So to balance that out, they actually removed the dark and ghost resistances. In retrospect, I think this change has felt massive, though dark and ghost stand alone as some of the best neutrally offensive typings in the game. And while steel is still the defensive king, I think removing more of its resistances and adding them to different types may be a healthy change. Also, changing fairy to resist ghost and making an underwhelming type like bug resist fairy could offer a noticeable enough impact without changing too much of the game's landscape. I think bug and ice types definitely deserve a little bit more love. One of the craziest changes we ever saw between generations was the idea of dynamic speed changes. Before Sword and Shield, speed changes would happen the turn after they were enacted. So, for example, Swift Swimmers would maintain their speed buff even if the weather had changed at the beginning of the turn, and Icy Wind would drop the speed of a Pokemon, but the change wouldn't go into effect until the next turn. With dynamic speed changes, this was basically flipped, and those speed changes would go into effect immediately. This was absolutely huge for moves such as Tailwind, and specifically, Prankster Tailwind on Whimsicott and Tornadus. Bringing those Pokemon to the forefront of the respective metagames, in a way that I think a lot would agree lacked a lot of counterplay. If you played Series 13 VGC at all, Whimsicott was just everywhere in that format. Other than setting Trick Room or using faster Tailwind abusing partners, there weren't really too many ways to stop this strategy. This change also had what looked to be an unintended side effect, a new strategy where players would trick an Iron Ball to immediately drop an opposing Pokemon's speed by half. Now, interestingly enough, this did not apply to Lagging Tail, which would make a Pokemon move last always, and so yeah, you can say that's either by oversight or was done intentionally, but I think that that was smart. Now, with some time to reflect on it, I think with the changes to the speed mechanics were somewhat of a healthy way to level the playing field of all speed control tactics, but I can't help but feel like Prankster Tail Wind in particular ended up being way too centralizing, and I hope in Scarlet and Violet that combination either gets nerfed a little bit or more counterplay is available. To conclude, I want to address a couple of areas where there was an attempt to maybe fix things, but generally I see as a failure, and where we can consider looking next. The first area is stat buffs. Stat buffs were a nice change to see as power creep becomes an issue from generation to generation, especially with DLC on the table, but I'd like to see a better attempt at this. Alternate forms tend to do the job nicely, but just making bad Pokemon better is welcomed by most. Mantine, Executor, Dodrio, specifically stand on a group of Pokemon that received buffs to their base stats, but just never really found a place in any of the respective VGC metas that they had a chance in. Some items had great design philosophy, but really just barely missed the mark. Utility Umbrella, for example, helps ignore specific weather bonuses to damage, and this item even had a use on Tornadus in VGC 2022 to mitigate the amount of damage from Kyogre and Rain. In my opinion, it would have been a much better item if it negated weather boosts entirely, the way Let Cloud 9 works. A jackpack also feels like an item that never really got its moment in VGC, but for a separate reason. Because this item can be activated by Intimidate, its activation condition is out of the user's control. Adding the stipulation that it can only activate when stats are dropped by the Pokemon holding it would make it much more viable in VGC. Thunder Wave having nerfed accuracy and paralysis being only a 50% speed reduction felt like the opposite change that many competitive players wanted. The one fourth speed mechanic was a unique characteristic of paralysis that a lot of players enjoyed utilizing. Many players would rather see the immobilization chance removed, or at least limited till the first turn. Instruct, Decorate, and Map Block are moves that, in theory, could break the game if they became more accessible. I wouldn't suggest that a bunch of Pokemon get access to these moves, but a few key Pokemon getting these moves could shake up the meta a lot, and I'd love to see Game Freak consider trying that out in the same way they did with Parting Shot. Of course, this is a more delicate one, and if they weren't, that's okay as well. On the opposite end of that, 
I have no idea why Ally Switch was distributed to anything with the color pink or purple in its design. And I just think that introduced a abnormal amount of variance. On top of that, the move got a plus two priority buff, and the move I just felt like was generally, you know, not as competitive as I'd liked it to be. And yeah, we saw especially on Shedinjas in the VGC 2022 format. So much that Rocky Helmet Zapdos became a thing that was used as counterplay by Eric Rios, one of the best players in the world throughout the season. Giving this move a chance to fail like Destiny Bond would be a really healthy change, and I am sure that most of Europe agrees, especially after playing against so many allies with Shedinjas. Something I've always disliked are great abilities on Pokemon that, for a lack of a better word, just kind of suck. Slush Rush, Merciless, Toxic Boost, Filter, and many other abilities follow this pattern. Adding these to some of the new Pokemon or some older ones that could really make use of these abilities would be awesome. They have a lot of potential, but we just don't get to see it utilized very much. Adjusting the base stats of the ones that suck would also be nice too, but understandably that can be difficult to adjust when considering the way a meta will develop. Finally, an adjustment that I'd want to see is also the status moves. Freeze is, I just think, uncompetitive and bad, and Legends Arceus even retooled it in a way that I think could be a test for a change to what Freeze could mean for the future. Limiting the turns a Pokemon can stay frozen, or changing into a special burn would be interesting. Paralysis, as I mentioned, should have some type of limit to the immobilization mechanic, and sleep being adjusted to maybe just being a guaranteed two turns would serve all players wanting a more manageable board state on both sides. Overall, I think it's really interesting to just look at some of the major fine-tuning and changes that Game Freak has spent years doing for competitive Pokemon. We didn't get to cover all of them in this video, but, you know, of course, the ones that were mentioned here were mainly kind of catered towards competitive VGC play. And overall, I think that they've done a great job for a lot of different areas. For me, I'd still like to see secondary effects maybe be removed from a lot of attacks. I think like Ice Beam inducing Freeze, Flamethrower inducing Burn, Thunderbolt inducing Paralysis, Rock Slide inducing Flinches. I think all of those moves would still be used plenty, even if they didn't have the secondary effects, but I'm just trying to think of ways to, you know, reduce variance a little bit. Ultimately, I think that we've seen things move in the right direction often, and Scarlet and Violet is a brand new opportunity to make competitive Pokemon the best that it's ever seen, and I'm really excited to see what changes it brings to BGC. This is my first time doing a video essay on this channel, so I really hope you enjoyed. It was a lot of fun to make, and I really want to thank Justin Karras, who helped me with the script here, and Dro, who edited this, this video. So, yeah, hopefully this was a nice summary of a lot of the major balance changes that we've seen in competitive Pokemon throughout the years. I don't know if we'll ever actually get actual patches. I think that'd be really cool, but for now we'll just have to rely on a brand new generation and it's time to see what Scarlet and Violet will bring.